Are you feeling stressed? Do you want to express yourself by choking someone? Have you ever tried that? Maybe it's because you play too much video games with guns and stuff. Time has come to take a look at the other side of the coin. We briefly went through what games can do to our brains, emotions and what we know about playing as behavior. Now it is time to see if games are actually harmful. So far in my life experience, I have seen three things that pop up here and there against playing computer games. I haven't seen anyone complaining about board games of any type and there is definitely something to say about gambling games and addiction. But gambling is something I would like to deal with in a separate video. So, we're left with computer slash video games. The first and most controversial thing that we're going to discuss is the occasional video games promote aggression wave that hits the patterns around the globe. It also happens to other types of media that display rather violent or gory content, but as far as I can see, nothing has changed for now. I wonder why. Now, thinking seriously on this topic, I cannot remain blind to the fact that the presence of frightening, violent and gory imagery in popular culture is nothing new. Ancient Greeks and Romans had horror elements in their legends, and we know that thanks to written language. These tales probably followed us alongside from the beginning of our cultural development. Death, violence and all kinds of monsters can be found in ancient tales up until modern days, where we have books, movies and recently video games in that genre. So why? Why we continue to consume this type of information and what's the reason? Well, it might have a connection to the need of mastering emotional sensations while being afraid. Basically, another type of training for our brains. I also want to put some food for thought here. An interesting fact I know for sure from Robert Sapolsky's lectures. What I learned is that aggressiveness is related to the centers of the brain that deal with fear. One goes with the other and probably fear comes first. Now back to the topic. So the need to expose ourselves to frightening but harmful experience might be a way to train and maintain our system. Then again, up until around the Victorian era, parents of the past used to consider preparing their children for the hardships of life using these scary tales in contrast to the modern society where we seemingly try to overprotect them. Today we consider the violent media for adults or taboo, and maybe this shift of view made some people unreasonably scared from the possible impact on society. This often leads to misinterpreting situations, disregarding scientific and historical data, and a lot of noise on the media. That, of course, did not stop anyone from going for the troll. Why do games spawn that big of a concern? Because of their interactive nature, of course. Compared to the passiveness of other forms of violent media, it is not strange that some people feel bigger threat. The actual opportunity to participate in the act, even virtually, may appear scary for some folks, yet it turns out that it's pretty hard to tie aggression in gamers' behavior with violent computer games, at least not in the way some people see it. Let me show you why. There are models that researchers use to calculate the specific impact of media, and one of them is GAM, or General Aggression Model. Fortunately for gamers, this model has many holes to cover. GAM's general idea is that media heroes or game avatars serve as social role models and therefore influence people's beliefs and behavior. This of course has truth to some extent, but when comparing GAM to another model, like the Catalyst model, we see that it focuses only on cognitive scripts and not on personological variables. The Catalyst model on the other side takes into consideration elements such as biological predisposition to aggression and social environment. 
This model gives a better, more complete picture of the secrets to human aggressiveness. The role of the family, financial difficulties, relationship problems might have significant, if not even greater impact on one's life than media heroes. Even the Catalyst model might not be able to completely draw a picture of how, if at all, these violent games lead to violent actions. Other variables, like how tests are conducted, are also of importance, but more on that later. When asked if the volume of pleasure ties to the volume of gruesomeness, a lot of test participants find over-the-top aggression that you can't do in real life for enjoyable, but it is not the most important feature people look for. Challenge, action and content are actually the most demanded elements of a game. Sure, we cannot argue against the existence of people who indulge into playing computer games and are aggressive, intolerant or happen to be mass murderers at some point. And researchers did find out that people with high aggressiveness factor usually prefer playing violent games, but they did not make them violent in the first place. Now, I want you to imagine for a moment how many people play all these war and horror games. I play them. Shouldn't we all be some kind of twisted serial killer psychopaths? Fortunately, we have the amazing opportunity to observe past data and compare it to what we have today. This does not mean any drops in crime rates are because of gaming. For now, it just says that extreme claims are to be deemed unrealistic and have no ground. What we know until now from tests is that we need better ways to measure aggression and we need long-term observations and studies. After all, the important question is not are people generally more aggressive after a game, but more like are people becoming more and more aggressive in nature if they have the habit of playing games with violent content. Let's talk research now. A study on college students showed how violent games might make people a bit desensitized. There were two groups of participants, one that played 20 minutes of violent games and the second group played game with non-violent content for the same amount of time. Then the participants' psychological response was measured while they were watching real videos of violence. The people who played violent games showed less response to what was happening on the screen, but emergency physicians also have the same problem and it does not make them more aggressive or less likely to help people. A short-term arousal and the rise of aggressive thoughts after playing was also measured, but in the long term all these effects disappeared and became irrelevant. Other studies concluded that it might be actually the competitive side of games that promotes aggression, but then again, it was also observed as a short-term effect. Here comes the question, is competition good or bad, by the way? I cannot say for sure, but it's interweaved in the nature of this world. So, probably another video will have to deal with that. I'm writing it down. Another solid wall that researchers face is the ways tests are carried. We rely on methods like self-report, competitive reaction time task, hot sauce paradigm, yes, the latter relies on giving other people spicy treat. But these can't provide the sufficient data we need. Because of the many variables like game genre, personal preferences, frequency of playing, commitment, and age, researchers require standardized and validated instruments in order to come to more realistic results. The vast difference in pace and cognitive perception demand between games used in the studies also creates a problem when studying the effect of violent and non-violent games. It is absolutely normal for the player to be much more aroused after a game of CSGO or Mortal Kombat than after playing some kind of a puzzle like Tetris or a game like Sims. Because of this problem, an awesome experiment with four versions of Team Fortress 2 was made by Julia Neer, with the idea to eliminate some bad variables coming from the game. With a bit of customization, they came up with the following. There was hard version, easy version, violent flamethrower version, and a rainbow blower, non-violent version where opponents laugh their guts out after being burned with the colorful vomit of the pyro. The results showed no connection between in-game violence and aggressive human behavior. The study found that harder games often generate negative feelings and are exhausting, but the way that people cope with that varies vastly, as we already discussed in our previous video. 
Given the picture so far, I don't believe we will find the type of extreme correlation people are freaking about between violent games and aggressive behavior, even if we had more precise ways to test. We also have to consider the positive effects of these games as well, if we want to assess the impact of this type of media correctly. For now, you can rest assured, you probably won't become the next news headline just because you enjoy playing something with a lot of gore, unless, for example, you're psychologically prone to that. Play smart.